Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you all and welcome to our inaugural service here at Pendo Gospel Community Church. Um, indeed, it is the love of Christ that has brought us here together to worship Him. Before I begin today's uh, summer, uh, I, I want us to go before the Lord in prayer once again uh, as we give the Lord thanks and as we pray for uh, certain needs. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, how great is your name. You are worthy indeed of our worship, the worship of all creatures. And it is a privilege that you have opened our eyes to see that we ought to worship you and worship you aright. Mm -hmm. Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving this day as we begin this service, this worship service, as we worship together as your people. We are grateful that we have been privileged to meet together. There are many believers, many Christians in many nations who, have, who do not have the opportunity, the chance to be able to gather together. And they gather in secret, fearing oppression and persecution. And at this time, we want to remember them and to pray for them. Dear Lord, even though some may be alone, you are with them. May you encourage them. May you keep them. We ask, O oh Lord, that you may encourage and meet their needs this day. And we are grateful, Lord, that our government has allowed us to meet. Indeed, they do not offer opposition as we meet as God's people. And this has happened by your hand, O oh Lord. We know that the king's heart is in your hand to do with it as you please. And Lord, we acknowledge that you have set these leaders above us. And Lord, help us even as we are law-abiding citizens, more so to be citizens of heaven that please you. And Lord, as we worship you this day, as we hear your word, as we sing, as we fellowship, and all that we do, even our thinking and our speaking to one another, Lord, may we do all to your glory. And Lord, as I come to your word to bring this word to your people, I pray, Lord, that you may grant me clarity and boldness as I speak. May you help me to be faithful to your word, not to my own ideas. Lord, may you open our eyes of faith and our ears, O oh Lord, that we may hear your word and receive it by faith, not as a word of man. This is not my word, but your word. And so I pray for the Holy Spirit's help, that I may be able to bring this word carefully, and in a way that glorifies you. Indeed, may Christ be seen at the end and no one else. And Lord, I want to bring various needs to you. I pray for Winnie Perez, who is part of us. Uh, she is uh, having issues with her health. Dear Lord, I pray that you may be able to help her. May you bring her wholeness uh, of body. And Lord, grant her relief and help her to persevere even through the pain and through the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Help her to look to Christ even as she undergoes this pain. Mm -hmm. That she may look forward to the return of Christ. Mm -hmm. For he is coming with the glory of the Father. Mm -hmm. And when he comes back, all pain will be taken away. Mm -hmm. There will be no more discomfort. Mm -hmm. We pray for her family as well. We pray for her sister who also is struggling with issues of health, and pray the same prayer, Lord, that you may grant her wholeness of body. And even as you keep her in that state of uh, discomfort, Lord, may you grant her patience. May you grow her as a person, more so to be made into the likeness of Christ. We pray for our family members, we pray for our parents. We pray, Lord, that you may grant them a right understanding of your word, that they may come to worship you truly and faithfully in spirit. We do pray, O oh Lord, for Joy, my sister, who, uh, uh, had a diff uh, who is having uh, pain in her foot. We pray, O oh Lord, that you may grant her relief as well, that she may be able to uh, walk around well, 
And Lord, the prayer is the same, that she may see Christ, even through this. You assure us, especially in the books of James and Peter, First Peter, that even our suffering does not go to waste, O oh Lord. Even our pain does not go to waste. And so, Lord, may you use this period of pain that these dear sisters are going through to encourage them and to grow them more in the likeness of Christ who came and died for us. We pray for this area, O oh Lord. Indeed, there are many people here, about 100,000 souls, people who need to hear the gospel, people who need to know Christ. We pray, Lord, that we may be instruments of bringing the gospel to them, that they may hear Christ, their need of Him, because they, as we, are sinners and need Christ every day. And so help us to be faithful in proclaiming that to them. We pray for the peace of this region. We ask, Lord, that you may help it to be peaceful, especially as we are heading into an election year, so that people may be able to conduct their business in peace, and also that the gospel might be able to continue progressing in this area. Indeed, there was a fire a few days ago in our neighborhood, and we pray for many who lost many of their items. We are grateful that no life was lost. And we ask, Lord, that you may comfort those who lost of different possessions, that you may help them to find a place where they may find shelter, be especially with the mothers and children, O oh Lord. And Lord, we ask even once again that Christ may be proclaimed more in this region of Maruroi mm. and the whole northern bypass, mm. that people even through this local church, through our evangelism efforts and other like-minded churches around us might come to know Christ. And him crucified. Indeed, Lord, we are here because of you. Our life is as a result of you sustaining us as governor of the universe. Our eternal life is as a result of Christ dying for us on the cross and taking our sins on our behalf. And so we owe you everything we have and we are. And we ask, Lord, that we may grasp how precious Christ is. Indeed, as we now turn to the scriptures to learn about the love of Christ in and through us, mm -hmm. may we grow to be a people of love. Mm -hmm. People who love you chiefly mm -hmm. and love one another as well. Mm -hmm. This we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Once again, just allow me to welcome each and every one of you to this first service of Bendo Gospel Community Church. It is an honor to have you join us and encourage us as we begin uh, to proclaim Christ. Uh, we are grateful even for the owners of this establishment who have been able to give us uh, this room to use. Indeed, this is, it is not common. We, we traveled quite a distance uh, around these regions to find a place to meet. So we thank God that he uh, worked in their hearts to let us meet here. But thank you all for coming, and I hope that we are serving you well, uh, especially to bring Christ to your mind and to your heart. My name is Joe Mwita Thwagi, and I am a believer, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me about eight years ago and he has taken me through the life of Christianity in a great way through ups and downs I have learned it has mainly been through my hard-heartedness that I have not been able to grow more than I am now in Christianity but I thank the Lord that he has enabled me to know him more and more and I welcome you uh, to this first sermon as we look at the words that John has to tell us in the first letter of John, I hope that by the end of it, you can be able to see the love of Christ working in and through us. Because that's what I want us to see. Indeed, we have called ourselves Upendo Gospel Community Church. We are a people of love. And that is what we want to explore. Upendo is the Swahili word for love. We want to see this love of God working 
in us and through us and what the scriptures have to say about it. And so let us turn to God's word in 1 John. 1 John, the fourth chapter. One John four. So that's not the Gospel of John. It's the letter, the first letter of John, chapter four. Now read from verse seven to twenty-one. <clears throat> first John four seven to twenty-one. I'm waiting for those who are here together. Now read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love good God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him. That he who loves God must love his brother also. That is the word of the Lord. John, in this first letter, uh, is presenting Christ. Indeed, he begins by talking about that which he saw, him and his fellow disciples, that which he touched with his own hands, that which he heard with his own ears. That's what he begins with in chapter 1 of 1 John. And he is uh, in part correcting uh, some who are teaching certain false doctrines at the time. And these were people who uh, either claimed that Jesus did not come in the flesh, that as Jesus walked, you could only see a form but even as he walked in the sand, you could not see the footprints that he left because he was not in the flesh. Indeed, they did not believe that God could come in the flesh. And this is part of what John is contending against as he writes this letter. And as he continues, he's writing it to believers. His aim is not to condemn. This book sometimes can be wrongly used to condemn. His aim is to assure the believer that we have been saved by Christ. Indeed, those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was sent by the Father, that he came in the flesh, 
are saved and have eternal life. And as he continues to talk about believing in Christ, as he continues to warn them about certain false teachings, false doctrines, he comes three times in this letter to the topic of love. In chapter 2, he talks about love. In chapter 3, he talks about love for one another. And here in chapter 4, he comes upon the climax of his topic of love. One thing that he does not do in the other sections that he does here in verses 7 to 21, as we shall see, is that he shows us the source of love, where love comes from. And he has told them not to love the world or the things in it. He has told them to love one another and to share their earthly belongings as a proof of the love that they have for one another. But here he begins supremely with God. That love comes from God downward to us. And what he wants to show his readers, what he wants to communicate to his readers, is that this love has come to us, not so that we may just selfishly accept it and bask in it and then continue li living our lives as if there is no result of that, but that this love that comes from above helps us and shows us and directs us how we ought to love one another. That is the point, the whole point of this section. And I'm hoping to show that as I continue uh, to, uh, to expose it, this uh, small section. And so he begins, um, rather he's continuing his writing, uh, but in our text he begins by saying, Beloved, it's a word that he's used over and over again, uh, which the love that John here is referencing because he's talking about the love that comes from God is what we commonly know as agape love. Right? The love that comes from God. So the beloved there, in effect, is those who have agape love. So he is talking about the loved ones, which I believe is every believer who has been loved by Christ. So he's beginning by writing to believers, loved ones, you who have been loved. In verse 7, he's telling them, let us love one another. Now, why is this a radical statement? I mean, people, and in the world you find these mantras that are talking, you know, that human beings are core, at core are people of love. You know, why is it that this needs to be enumerated in the scriptures? Why is it that John seems to be saying something important here? Is he not just repeating what other people know? I mean, we ought to love one another, after all. But no, because as we shall see, the love that John here is talking about is a love that comes from God and is a different kind of love. Not the love of the world. It is not the love of a father to a child, primarily. That is a good love, but that is not the love that he's talking about here. It is not the love that is shared between friends, which you can sacrifice for a person whom you love. It is the kind of love that Christ spoke about when he said, love your enemies. Love those who you are bitter with. Those who do not deserve your time in your mind. That is the love that he is talking about here when he says, beloved, let us love one another. Okay? And so he begins by encouraging them, having come, in, uh, come from a section uh, talking about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, he, he begins by encouraging them, let us love one another, for love is of God. Why should we love one another? Because love is of God. What does he mean? That love comes from God. The source of love is God himself. And so we who have been born again, who have been loved, and that's what he's saying, everyone who loves is 
born of God and knows God. If you say that you have been born by God, if you have been born again, then you ought to be people of love. Now why is that important? Because God made us to be like Him. And He is the source of love. He sends love down to us. And we, if we have been born of Him, if we are now his children, as children imitate and look like their parents, so ought we to be people of love. This love comes from God down to us. It is not a love that is born in our hearts, naturally. We cannot manufacture it. We can show love to people we favor. But there is always an ulterior motive, one way or the other. But this love is not that kind of love. A love that is pure, unadulterated, has no blemish coming from heaven, from God to us. And he continues just in the same section saying that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Again, the love being referenced here, I have to reiterate, is not the love that the world preaches. It's not the love that you find in every family generally. What it means is everyone who loves in the way God loves, unselfishly, without looking only at their own interests, that person has been born of God. What John is saying is that the love that those who claim to be Christians show, not say with their lips, is proof that they have been born again. Here he is showing one great proof of salvation. And that proof is love. Loving like God. So he says, he who does not love, indeed, does not know God, for God is love. You know, very many people claim to know God. Very many people say, I know God. There are people who have studied the doctrine of God and can be able to give you in detail who and what God is in nature and persons. But what is John telling us here? That the one who does not love, despite all the intellect they may have, despite all the education they may have, despite all the authority they may have, despite the claims of their own lips, if a person does not love with the love of God, if this is not evident in their lives, that person, does not know God. The word know in the scriptures is a word you come across many times. We many times do not read through the genealogies, but when you go to the genealogy in, in um, one of the genealogies in Genesis, it gives the line of Adam, right? And one of the things you find as you're continuing is you come across the word know, know, know. And Adam knew his wife. Abraham knew his wife, and so on and so forth. The word know as is used there is what is meant here. That it is a knowledge, not an intellectual knowledge, but a knowledge that is experiential. To know God is not to know merely about God. To know God is to experience experience God in our lives and to display that. That is what John is saying here. Knowing God doesn't have to do with theology primarily. It is a part of it because you have to know the right conception of God. However, what is the end of it? What is the result of it? How is it proven that you love and know God 
It is that you show love to others the way God shows love to us. John 3.16, the most popular verse in the Bible, makes a very radical statement. Very radical. For God so loved the world. God in this manner loved the world. Why is that radical? Of course, God is holy, knowing the story of sin, our history as mankind. God is holy, and we sinned against the eternal holy one. And that brought judgment upon us. Indeed, we deserved the hate of God. Here, we sometimes love to use the word justice and judgment as if God was indifferent to our sin. God was not indifferent to the sin that Adam and Eve performed and we in them performed. When Adam and Eve sinned, they deserved the wrath, the fury, and the anger of God in its full extent, which means eternal hell. But what does, what does John 3.16 say? God loved the world. That love, not to people who he would gain by. What, what was there to gain? Indeed, there was much to gain by God judging the world. How? His justice would be upheld. He would be seen as holy, as one who does not mix with sin at any point. Perfect righteousness and holiness is in him. Yet, as we read in James, his mercy triumphed judgment. God loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, the holy and innocent one who had not sinned at all. Who is the only beloved one? He gave him. For who? For those who deserved judgment, wrath, hatred from him. Those who could not gain him anything those who could not add anything to his glory, those who could not add to his godhood, he would remain God forever praised if all of mankind perished forever. He would. He is God forever. Yet, to display his grace and mercy and love, he does a most incredible thing by sending his only begotten son who deserved only his adoration and love, who was the only one who deserved worship, and was worshipped by the angels before he came in the flesh. Who is God forever praised, as Romans 9, 5 reminds us of Christ. Who even as was born in the flesh was still worshipped by men of note, the wise men, by men who are not of note, the shepherds who was worshipped by the angels in the flesh, he sent him to come, to live, to obey, to suffer, to die a shameful death, naked on a cross, cast, despised, rejected. All for who? For some of those who put him literally on that tree on that day, and for everyone else who put him on that tree represented him. For all of us who believe in him. And he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him, in that son, should not perish. But have everlasting life. Everlasting life. To those who deserve everlasting death. Quite the turnaround. This is not rags to riches. It is rags to glory. I don't know how to describe it. That is the love of God to us. And that is the love that we are being called to here. That we should love like God. For love is of God. It comes from God. It communicates who God is. It communicates his nature to us. It shows us his will for us. 
That is how we, you and I, are to love one another. And he who does not love in that manner, despite all their claims, does not know God. For God, essentially, in his nature, by himself, how he is, is love. He is so full of it, it constitutes him. And he is able to give vastly, richly, to save millions of sinners and to do it to the uttermost. There is nothing that is not given to us from the Father. Indeed, Christ tells us that the Father delights in giving us the kingdom. He loves to do it. What do we not have that Christ has? We are co-heirs with Him, as Romans 8 tells us. We inherit with Him. And we are made sons, like he is. The only difference is he is his only begotten. We are his adopted sons. But we share in the sonship that Christ has. And that is the love of God for us. So John continues that in verse 9, showing how in this the love of God was manifested to us. This is what I have been able to explain. How he sent his only begotten son into the world. That we might live through him. That we might live through him. That Christ is the reason that we live the kind of life that we live as believers. It is only because of Christ and what he did, what he accomplished on that cross. It is only because the Father sent him. It is only because Christ was willing, not just able, because he could have been able but unwilling. But he was willing to the very end. To the very end. Even when they mocked him and told him, if you are the son of God, come down from that tree. He would have. He did not. He knew why he was doing it. And he did it not, you know, not uh, without understanding the full implication. The Garden of Gethsemane shows us, is to show us that Christ understood the heavy weight that he was about to take on himself. So Christ had counted the cost on his part. And so on the cross, as he was thinking of you and I, he knew. He knew. And he was willing. No, we, we see people going around and when politicians come, people throng around the politicians. You know, they come in big cars and, and, and they, they sit on the sunroof and they begin addressing the people. And they start telling the people how much they love them and how much they are willing to sacrifice their lives and break their backs for them to bring development to their areas. God help some of them to be actually sincere. But what we see as these politicians do this is people believing them. People willing to die for them. People willing to break their backs for them in return. Yeah, we know even the best one of them, when pushed to the very edge, will fall under the weight. They will not give what they promised. And people have seen this over the course of many years, many elections. Promises after promises. And it's the same promises again and again. It's not a different promise. But people still come. People still show love. And people are willing to respond to what they are claiming. But here is the Son of God. With His promises. Full of them. From the Father to us and he comes and leaves for 33 years has a ministry of three and a half years telling the people what the kingdom of heaven is all about and what he has come to do and he has come to heal the sick to make free the captive and he has come to bring the greatest gift any man would want men are always looking to prolong their lives 
the kid is crying, saying, I have come with eternal life. There's no, there's no need to keep prolonging it over and over. I give it to you once and for all, if you believe in me. And that is what he has come with from the Father. And he gives promises and promises. And history has proved his promises true, yet... How many are willing to break their backs? I'm not speaking literally. How many are willing to do for him, to respond in a like manner by making their lives a spiritual sacrifice? By living in obedience to his commands. His yoke is easy. He does not require as to turn heaven and hell to respond to what he has done. And here is his command. Love one another. And he says, this is how the world will know that you are mine. If you love one another. And he demonstrates it. He goes to the cross. Again, we cannot overemphasize how great that event is 2,000 years ago. Demonstrated it before the world, as it were, put on the center of the world in front of all peoples. Of course, they thought they were shaming him. They were putting him to sleep. But indeed, Christ was demonstrating the Father's love for us. And all that is that we, this is the response, might live through him. He represented us so that we, in him and through him, might live. Verse 10. And this is love. Not that we love God. You see, this love, as I said, is not manufactured in us. It has to come from God. Why is that? We do not know how to love like God. We cannot. By our own selves, we cannot. Again, our history as human beings proves that. The Bible testifies about that. We fell into sin. We fell into a trench that we cannot get out of. You are asking a fish to fly. Well, there are fish that fly, but you get the point. You are asking a man to do the impossible when you tell him to love like God, if God has not helped him. It is impossible. And so how is it made possible? Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, there are two things there. One, our sins get in the way of us loving God and loving one another. And they have to be dealt with. If we are going to love like God, John here in verse 10 is telling us there has to be a propitiation, a quenching of our sins. There has to be a removal of it, of the wrath of God against our sins. And that's how Paul begins Romans in Romans 1. That the wrath of God abides, is coming for every unrighteousness and ungodliness of man. It comes and it's aimed well at all sinners and it will find its target. And so we are doomed if we are left to our own resources, to our own heart. But look at the love of God. He knows we are doomed. He sends help by his son who dies and takes away his wrath. Now, why, why could God not just overlook our sins. Why, why couldn't God just throw our sins under the carpet? Again, remember, God is just. God, as a just judge, has to punish sin. 
I mean, it would be inconceivable for us to think of certain people as unjust. Our parents, maybe our mothers, we think of them as just people. When someone came and told you that her, your mother oppressed them or did so, you know, that's something that maybe you may struggle to get. You may struggle to believe. Do we not think God is just? He will not let sin go unpunished. Because sin oppresses us. And God must be just. And God, therefore, has to expand his wrath on sin. But here's a problem. Sin does not exist just in the air. Sin is performed by its carriers, human beings. So if God is going to punish sin, necessarily, he will have to punish men. Here's the other problem. By default, because of what Adam did, and he was the best of us before you start blaming him, by default, we are born sinners. So that as R.C. Sproul say, we are not sinners because we sin. It's not because, you know, when you sin, now you become a sinner. No. We sin because we already are sinners. When we sin, we are doing what's according to our nature. When God loves, he's doing what's according to his nature. And the two cannot coexist. In fact, the two must fight against one another. So God's wrath is pointed at the sinner. But God in love sends Christ as a propitiation to take away the sin. How? Christ, one, represents us. He comes, a true man. But Christ is different. He's a man, like us, with a body and a soul, but without sin. His life is lived without sin, to the very end. He does not sin even as a baby. He does not sin as an adult. Christ does not, cannot sin because of the way in which he came into the world. Conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, but grew up as a true man. That makes his obedience worthy. The obedience he gives God in the 33 years that he lives, and the obedience he gives God especially in that last week of his life, and primarily at the cross, not just as a representative, not just as a sinless one, but as an innocent lamb. And that was the whole point of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. When the Jews would slit the throat of the lamb, it was to remind them that blood is standing temporarily in place, waiting for more worthy blood. So that as the blood of Christ flows out, there's not, nothing magical in his blood, as his life, because that's where the life is, as, you, as if your blood pours out, it is your life pouring out. As his life pours out of him, as he expires, as it were, as he dies, because he is there on the cross in the place of the sinner. And all the sins of all who believe in him, who believed in him in the past, who believe in him in the future, are placed on him at that precise moment. As he dies, sin that was there in those who believe in him, dies with him. Sin is taken away. God's wrath is poured out to the last drop. To the very last drop. Upon Christ. His fury is exercised on Christ on that cross. Christ suffers for your sin and my sin on that cross and in that way. Takes away, quenches 
the need for justice. So that if justice stands and says, this man, this woman is a sinner, and Christ died for you, justice is shown Christ, and justice is appeased. That is propitiation. Christ taking away the wrath of God. Christ taking our just judgment on himself so that we may live through him. So Christ is sent and he dies and he becomes a propitiation. But who sends him? The Father. And he does that entirely and purely out of love. The mercy of God is not like human mercy. There is some similarity, but we are not to begin with the human and go back to God. It is not as if God looks on you and I and sees something in there worth pitying. When he looks at you and I in our sinful state, what he sees there deserves judgment. But without being moved from outside himself, and this is why you must see the purity of God's love and mercy, in himself, of his own initiative, of his own truly free will, he chooses to have mercy, to display it, to demonstrate, to demonstrate it in the most illustrious way, sending his son. And that's why John says that love is not that we loved God, that's not how we are measuring this love. It's not that we love God and now people can be able to say, you truly are loving people. You know, you've heard about this God, he's been preached to you, and you've received him. And that's great love. No. Love is what God did for us and is doing in us. Because that's what causes us now to love him and to love one another. So John continues, beloved, in verse 11, if God so loved us, if God in this manner loved us, if he went to these great lengths, if he went to all this to demonstrate his love for us that is pure, Shouldn't it be the result that we love one another? I mean, if, you, if such great mercy has been shown to you and great compassion, shouldn't you also love your neighbor as yourself? Love your enemy and pray for them as Christ instructs us? Love those who do not deserve your love? Shouldn't that be the result of what God has done for us? Loving one another, showing it, displaying it, demonstrating it, going to great lengths as the Father has, thinking of others more highly, being compassionate of others, sharing even your worldly goods, in effect, putting your money where your mouth is, demonstrating love to the brethren, to other human beings made in the image of God as a result of what God has done for you. That should be the result. That should be the result of love. And so we have been loved and loved greatly. And so we also ought to love one another. And then John, going back to the concept of knowing God that we began with in verse 7 and 8, presents a problem in verse 12. We say that we know God, but no one has seen God at any one time. Of course, we teach that God is invisible. We cannot see him with our eyes. We cannot perceive him with our common senses. We cannot touch him. So how then can you love that which you do not see, hear, touch? How? How can you, who has not seen God, be able to love him? And that's why when we began, I was trying to show how this love working in and through us 
resulting in loving others is the proof that we know God, even though we have not seen him with our eyes. That becomes the proof. In effect, Christians are like windows. You see this window? It's clear. It is showing me the outside. It works not just to receive the light, but the light works in it and through it, penetrating beyond it. Christians are like windows. The love of God should not come to us and bounce back. It should penetrate us, transforming our lives, changing us, making us love others as we love ourselves. But it should also be seen, it should be clear that it is the light of God that is working in us so that others are able to see God through us and they are able to know that we know God and we belong to God. That is how our love should be. It is a transformative love. But it is a love that mediates, in effect, that shows the love of God to others. In our acts of love, we should show who God is. Because what we are communicating is that God has so worked in our lives. When we love others in the way that we love them, we are showing how God has loved us. And as Christians, of course, we know that we fail in great ways. You know, we fail to show the love of God. We, show, we, we fail to show this kind of love. Not many are willing to die for a brother or a sister. Not many are willing to go to great lengths, even though truly they are born again. But remember, Christ has died for our sins, not as an excuse, but that should be used to encourage us, even when we fail in love, to come back to the scriptures and encourage ourselves to look to Christ as an example, but also as the one working in and through us. Christ, in effect, loving through us. So no one has seen God at any point, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So, two things are connected here. God's love and God's spirit. How do we know that God abides in us? That God's Spirit dwells in us. That we have received His Spirit. But how can we prove that? By showing the fruit of the Spirit. Which chiefly begins with love. Galatians 5 begins that fruit with that aspect called love. It is a fruit, a result of the Spirit abiding in us. So that this becomes again proof that God dwells in us. That Christ by His Spirit lives and works in and through us. When we love one another, when we love other people. And so, when you want you to be assured as a believer, to be assured that the Spirit works in and through you, that you do have the Holy Spirit in you, that you do not need to wait for another time to receive the Holy Spirit, let that be evident by how the most intellectual and the least intellectual are able to show by God's help and grace this love and to prove by that that God's spirit dwells in them. This does not need a second in feeling. The spirit dwells in us and we prove it by how we love 
one another. By how that fruit of love is evident in our lives. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. So those are the two things that John here is connecting in verses um, 12, the end of verse 12 and verse 13. And we know that his love as well has been perfected, that is matured in us, has been completed in us. But when we are able to show this love, that this love is shown to be completed in us. And he continues that, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Indeed, as we have seen over and over again. It is the Father who sent the Son. Therefore, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and him. So you show love to others and you confess and this is why I say this is not the kind of love you find in families. It is the love that can only be shown by those who confess, who in their hearts believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God. In effect, those who know their sins have been taken away. Christ is their Savior. And who believe that Christ is not only man, but God himself in the flesh. And as he says in John chapter 5, he, 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 he continues speaking to the Jews, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's telling them, the way you think of the Father is the way you should think of me. If you give honor to the Father, you should give honor to the Son. The Father has given judgment to the Son. In fact, he himself does not do the judgment. It is the Son who does the judgment. The Father has life in himself. The Son has life in himself. He is truly and specially the very Son of God. And we have to believe and confess that. We have to teach it to ourselves and to others. We have to live like that is the truth. And if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, He is your Lord. And you obey Him. And therefore, if you do not live a life in obedience to the Son of God, who is also your Savior, not just your Lord, He's taken away your sins, but you also live a life of obedience, but there is proof that God abides in you. There is proof. In addition to you showing love and being assured that you have God's Spirit dwelling in you. That is what John is saying. And so he's connecting all these, as it were, tests of Christianity to show that all this work together in tandem to show the Christian. That is what John here is doing. So we believe, we have seen and we testify. Now I say part of it was that he was opposing some people who are teaching that Jesus did not come in the flesh. And that's why he may be using this word that we have seen. He means literally with his own eyes. I have seen him. And I testify that the Father has sent the Son as a Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God, God abides in him and he in God. So God abides in you. He lives in you. And you was being counted as his child are in him. And it is as a result of our union with Christ that we are in God. We cannot be people of God, children of God. We cannot be in God if we do not believe in the salvation of Christ. If we do not, in effect, confess our sins and repent of them and turn to Christ in faith as the Savior of the world and believe that He is God forevermore praised. We are not in God and we do not know God. So He says, we have known in verse 16 and believe the love that God has for us. Indeed, He repeats again, God is love. 
It's not just an attribute of God. It's not God has love. God essentially is love. He's not only love. That is not the only thing he is. But love is so a part of him that in whatever God does, whether it is ruling or disciplining, whether it is sending affliction or saving, whatever God does, love is such an essential component to him. God is so love that all he does, he does in love. God is love. And he who abides in love, abides in God. That is he who continues in love. He who continues to do these deeds of love consistently. Who lives a life of demonstrating and showing love. That person abides in God and God in him. You see the primacy of love. The primacy of love for the Christian. You cannot be a Christian if, if, you're not demonstrating love to God and love to others consistently the same way God has demonstrated it to us. We are creatures of love as new creatures. We are creatures of love. Necessarily must be creatures of love if we are Christians. If we are Christians. And no one is a Christian who does not love like God. Not like the world. Like God. And so it gets to the point of this love being perfected. Being made complete. In verse 17. Love. This love we're talking about has been perfected among us in this way. It has been perfected and this is the proof of it. That we will have boldness in the day of judgment. Again, we, we, we love to connect justification to judgment, but rarely do we connect love to judgment, to the judgment day. You know, we love to say, I've been justified and so I will stand boldly on that day, which is true, very true. But here John is saying, in, in, indeed, another way to know that on that day you will stand boldly is that you love. You are identified as a loving person the way God loved you. So that's, that's the idea that he is communicating. Because the last part of verse 17 is what tells us that. Because as he is, that is as Christ is, so are we in this world. Right now, as Christ was loving, so are we. This is our confidence for Judgment Day. As Christ loved us, so are we on this side of eternity. So that on that day, when you stand before him, and you are not as he is, you will have reason to fear. And that's the point he's making in verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. You will be tormented on that day. In your mind. It will become apparent you are not like Christ. So who are you standing as on that day? Because only those who were like Christ will be like Christ on that day. Only those who loved like Christ will be shown the love of God and of Christ on that day. And that love, as we are reading here, the word perfect is mature or complete, is a consistent love that matures, that grows. It's, it's not a stagnant love. It's not just showing acts of compassion which are good but the point that he is making is a love that grows into maturity 
so that you become a consistent person, not like a child who is inconsistent, who is imperfect in that sense, who shows, who can show love right now and the next minute they are not showing love. That as a Christian there should be a growth that results in perfect, consistent love. And that is the kind of people that we, you and I, should be. And that mature love casts out all fear. And we can stand boldly before Christ. That he indeed has loved us. And we have shown this love without restricting it. So there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. It only proves that they have not matured in love. It's not, he is not talking about the Christian who is growing. He's talking about the Christian or the professing Christian who refuses to grow. That is the point. It's not that those Christians who would have become like the thief on the cross who was a Christian for probably a few hours only. That's not the point. That is only those who have not lived many years showing love. No. It is a kind of love that is consistent in its period. That man showed love to Christ. And of course he was enabled by Christ on the cross to show that love to him. That man showed love to his fellow robber and actually witnessed to him on the cross. He reminded him why they were there. And he reminded him Christ did not deserve to be there. That man showed love in his period. So mature love is not a love that is there for 30 years. That's not the point. Is that you have been there for a while and there is no progress in your love. You do not want to demonstrate it. You do not want to show it. Opportunity after opportunity, and believe me, God gives opportunity every day, is there, but you do not demonstrate it. As a result, you stagnate. And what John is saying is, of course, on that last day, there will be questions. Opportunities were there. And you can testify to that. Mature love, consistent love, a love that abides in us and is shown in and through us consistently. And even though we fail, we seek to show the love again and again. And one that transforms us inwardly, that changes us, that challenges us. That is the kind of love that we ought to pursue and mature in. And that casts away fear. Indeed, we love Him. Whether this refers to God or Christ is not really, really relevant. Because it's the same object. We love Him. We love the one who died for us. And we love, in effect, the one who sent Him to die for us because of that very fact. He fasts loved us. God took the initiative. God did not stand to gain a single thing by loving you and I like you stand to gain by loving other people. His love is not like ours in that sense. Yet, he first loved us. He demonstrated it before we could even demonstrate that we are able to love him back. So that in Romans we read, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die for those who showed potential. Show me you can love me. No. He died for sinners, miserable sinners. There was no hope in effect of them loving him. And it is only that love communicated to them that awoke the love that responds back to him. And that is how we are as Christians. We love him now. We realize we have been loved. 
and we are called to love. And because he has loved us, because he has shown this great example, we can only love him and others. And, and again, that's what he is finishing in verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God, with your lips, that is, and you hate your brother, that is in your heart, that person is a liar. That person is a liar. One, they lie about God. They do not know God. And they do not love God. They hate their brother. And that's evident in verse 21, or in the second part of verse 20. He's giving a very obvious reason why. That God that you cannot see with your eyes, it's very easy to say that you love him. It's very easy to say that you love your country. Just to give an example. Speaking in abstract is very easy. I love my country. Oh, I love people from that country. Oh, I love those kinds of people. But live with them. Start interacting with them. Start knowing their faults and their sins. Start knowing how they are and what need they have. Start knowing that they keep asking you for this and that and they never give you anything. Love becomes difficult. Love is easy in the abstract. Love is easy when we think we're talking about that which is outside ourselves, out there. I love God. I know God. I mean, read in the Bible, God is Trinity. God sent Jesus to die for my sins. That's out there 2,000 years ago. But what is John saying here? If you cannot say that about the brother that you know, the sinning, falling, Pesty brother who you wish would call you less, who you wish would be more responsible, who you wish had a better path in life. If you do not love that brother and yet you say you love God, you are lying. The scriptures are not mincing there. Words. John is not mincing his words. He's not trying to make it pretty. You are a liar. You have entered into that category that will not inherit the kingdom of God. You are a hypocrite. You claim one thing, but demonstrate another. You profess, but you don't possess. You only claim. I love God. I'm a Christian. <coughs> But is it true you are? Because how you can apply this in your life and how others can apply it in your life, but chiefly you, is by looking at your life from the lens of love. Love to God by how you love the one you live with, the one you see frequently, the one you can touch, the one you can hear with your ears audibly, the one you can speak to and be able to exchange edifying words, that is how you know that you love God. That is what John is saying. And so, someone cannot claim to love God if they do not love their brother, if they hate their brother, if they hold a grudge against their brother. You cannot claim to love the God whom you have not seen. And this is the commandment we have from God. But he who loves God must love his brother also. And so there are two senses this commandment is to be understood. One, it is commanding us to act in this way. That he who loves God, say you love God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, demonstrate it. He demonstrated it. He has. But under that, the foundation of that is not merely the command, but the principle. He who loves God, it is assumed, loves his brother. So this is not just a dry command. It is a command built out of that principle. It is a lifestyle that you have. You already are, are loving your, your brother, your sister. You're demonstrating it. 
in various ways, in the little or big ways that you do. And that is the fulfillment of the command to love God. So that as Christ quotes Deuteronomy 6, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all that you have. And he's answering the scribe who, ans who asked him about the greatest commandment. He attaches, in Christ's own word, he attaches the second, which is like the first. It is not second in terms of inferiority. It is second only in terms of order, but equal in measure. Love God, love people, and the way you know you love God is that you love people. So let us love one another. As we begin, this is my encouragement, especially to those who will be joining us for a long time, consistently, that we be people of love, showing love to one another, demonstrating this in our lives every day, in the boring stuff, in the stuff that is not so electric, in a brother calling you to somewhere where you'd rather not be, but you know being there would encourage them. In helping them in ways that you'd have to sacrifice a bit. You'd have to pinch yourself a bit. In telling others about Christ and what he has done. In being bold in that. And in that way, you yourself become transformed and you grow in your love for God and for other people. And that's how we will be people of upendo, people of love, loving God and loving one another. Amen? Let us pray. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, great, immortal, invisible, only wise God, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the man who sits at your right hand, who stands in our place, the man of love. Indeed, we are grateful for this love that was demonstrated to us by you sending the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, to come and die on the cross. What greater love is there than this? We can be spent for our friends and family. Yet, when danger approaches, even though we may want to help them, we still want to preserve our own lives. But your son Christ did not preserve his life. He gave it all to the last drop of blood for us. He gave all his life that we might be saved. And that is the demonstration of the Trinitarian love that is shown outwardly. How grateful we are for this love. A love that does not shrink back. A love that does not hold back. A love that is unselfish. A love that takes initiative. A love that transforms and matures. A love that makes you abide in us forever. And a love that causes us not to be able to hold it in and hold it back, but to demonstrate to others as well. It is only because of what Christ did that we can be able to show acts of love, that we can be able to show sacrifice to our fellow brothers. And so we are grateful for you and for Christ and for the Holy Spirit who abides in us, transforming us every day so that we bear fruits in accordance with your nature, the fruit of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. And as we contemplate this truth in the coming days, months, years, may you help us to be people of love. May people see us and say, truly, these are Christians because of how they love one another and love other human beings. Be with us through the coming week. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.